uh, uh, North Carolina Biotech Center, the Triad Regional uh, Director for, for that center. And so we're very pleased uh, to have Nancy with us, and we want to thank the Biotech Center for their support, not just today, not just for the last few days, but over the last decade for what we're doing here. Nancy, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Green. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Russ, for the invitation to uh, introduce the special speaker today. Um, I need you to be a part of this introduction, so you need to listen closely. Um, you know, Dr. Anthony Antala is often described as a rock star, but to me, he's more of a superhero. He's a superhero disguised as a surgeon and a researcher, an author, and many other roles. So most of you, or some of you yesterday, heard the CEO of my organization talk about what we do and the importance of the work that we do in healing, fueling, and feeding the world. And I believe that superheroes like Dr. Atala are gonna lead the way. So, here's your part. When you think of a superhero, what comes to mind? Raise your hand. There are students in the room, right? Anyone else? Other than the cool costumes, what else comes to mind? There you go. Okay. Well, exactly. So when I was thinking, either I spent too much time with my children on snow break, but when I was thinking about Dr. Atala, you know, he's smart and he has extraordinary talents. Dr. Atala is a recipient of many awards, including the U.S. Congress-funded Christopher Columbus Foundation Award, bestowed on a living American who's currently working on a discovery that will significantly affect society. Most recently, Dr. Atala's team received the Edison Science and Medical Award in 2013. And of course, you have a lovely folder that describes all of his accolades. Dr. Atala is a superhero. He works, it takes courage, and his work is phenomenal, clearly noted with his leadership and contributions to organizations such as the National Institutes of Health, working group uh, with the working group on cells and developmental biotechnology, biology, excuse me, and the National Institutes of Health Bioengineering Consortium and the National Center Institutes Advisory Board. So that's a mouthful. Dr. Atala heads a team of over 300 physicians and researchers, over 10 applications of technologies that have come out of his lab have been used clinically. And most important as a superhero, Dr. Atala is a man of passion for the work that he does and compassion for those he helps. A few examples. In 2011, the Huffington Post acknowledged his work as one of the 18 great ideas of 2011, Time Magazine as one of the top five medical breakthroughs of the year, 2011, American Association of Retired Persons as one of the 50 influential people who will make life better in 2012. Time Magazine is one of five discoveries that will change the future of organ transplants in 2013. So I consider it a privilege to know him. I consider him a friend. And we're pleased to have him here in the Piedmont Triad in North Carolina. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Atala, who is the director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine and the W.H. Boyce Professor and Chair of Department of Urology at Wake Forest University. Nancy, thank you so much. That's probably the nicest introduction I've ever received. And uh, goodness, you know, probably my mom sent you. Uh, uh, I've never been called a superhero. The only power that I have is that every Thursday I have to take the trash out at home. So I know I can do that, and I have power over that. <laughs> but you're so sweet. Uh, to uh, to uh, your words are so kind, and and you're such a dear friend. Thank you for for all your comments. 
Also wanted to uh, uh, thank Russ Reed, uh, like Dr. Green mentioned. Russ, thank you for everything you do for our community for, and, and for this city, for our region, our state, and our nation. This grant, this Department of Labor grant that Russ heads, uh, it's a huge uh, $15 million commitment from the Department of Labor to retrain, uh, to retrain our future workforce and our current workforce. And so uh, uh, many of you are familiar with that, familiar with this program. But what I can tell you from my side is that at the Institute, we have had many of uh, these trainees come through our doors. People who were doing other things, who were in the textile industry, they were in the tobacco industry, and they, they were fully retrained. And now they're in the biotechnology industry. And to have this resource right here in our city, right here in Winston-Salem, is one of the best assets that we can have for our city and our state. So thank you for all you do uh, through this program. Uh, and Dr. Green, I have to tell you, I can't believe it. Every time I come to this institution, I, it gets bigger and more buildings and more programs and more students and more initiatives. And your visionary leadership is something that, that I am sure is already legendary and people will write about for many years to come. So thank you for all you do. It's great to be with you in this series, uh, this uh, SciTech series with you. And what I thought I would do today, uh, I was charged to talk to you about regenerative medicine, some of the work that we're doing in this field that we call regenerative medicine. And this is actually our institute building right here uh, at uh, Innovation Quarter downtown. Uh, and this is actually, many uh, people ask, well, what do you do there? What, what goes on at the institute? This is actually a painting that hangs at the at Harvard Medical School, and it shows the very first time an organ was ever transplanted. And in the back room, you see Harwell Harrison, who was a chief of urology, so dear to my heart. He was getting the he was actually retrieving the organ to be transplanted. And in the front room, you see Joe Murray, who was actually getting the patient ready for the transplant. The first organ to ever be transplanted was a kidney. And up to this point, the only option was for the patients to die. You had kidney failure, you died. There was no other option. So kidney transplantation and organ transplantation in general was one of the major advances and medical breakthroughs of the 20th century. And Joe Mary went on to win the Nobel Prize for this work and so many lives that were saved by this one single event that happened back in 1954. And Joe just passed away, actually, just a couple of years ago. He was still walking the hallways of uh, Boston Children's Hospital. But, you know, it's amazing to see all the lives that were saved by this work, but also to realize the challenges that we still face in terms of organ rejection and organ shortage. The fact is we keep getting older. We live longer. Medicine has done a great job at keeping us alive longer. And the longer we live, the more our organs fail. And decade, the number of patients on the transplant list has doubled, and the number of organs transplanted has remained about the same, entirely flat, pretty much. So that's where this field comes in that we call regenerative medicine, because the statistics are fairly devastating. Every 30 seconds, a patient dies from diseases that could be treated with organ replacement. And it's not just the organ shortage, but also when you transplant organs, it's also the rejection that occurs in those organs. Wouldn't it be great if we could regenerate, our, regenerate ourselves? Is that science fiction? Well, not really. This is actually a salamander limb. And this is real-time lapse photography showing how this limb totally regenerates over a period of seven days after injury, totally on its own. So the fact is that we as humans are also regenerating. We're regenerating all the time. So the challenge occurs when we have an injury or disease, and that's when regeneration stops. The concept of regenerative medicine to actually heal the body from within and without is not a new concept. It actually dates back to the 1930s. And this is a textbook that was first published in 1938 
and the title is The Culture of Organs. And you can see the co-authors, Alexis Carell, like Joe Murray, another Nobel Prize winner. He was a vascular surgeon from Lyon, France. His mother was a seamstress. He took a piece of hosiery material that was tubularized, sterilized it in alcohol, and he uses that for a replacement of a blood vessel in a surgical suite. And believe it or not, we're still using the same techniques that he developed back in the 1930s. We're still using those same techniques today. I want you to note his co-author. His co-author was Charles Lindbergh. That is the same Charles Lindbergh who actually flew, flew across the Atlantic back in the 1920s. He spent the rest of his life working at the Rockefeller Institute in New York with Alexis Carell. So this field then that we call regenerative medicine has a long history. And when we talk about regenerative medicine, we're talking about many different areas. We can talk about scaffolds alone. Scaffolds are materials, biological materials or biomaterials that we design and can make in the laboratory or we can manufacture. And these are materials that we use to put inside the patient. They look like your, a piece of your blouse or your shirt, but it has a the that is designed to resorb on its own over time, very much like the suture materials that we use in surgery today. So we can use scaffolds alone to regenerate tissues. We can use cells alone. We can use them together. So let's say, for example, that we would like to use scaffolds alone. We really borrow from a family of over 30 different materials. A lot of these, the same materials that we use in surgery, like the hernia meshes that dissolve on their own, sutures that are used in surgery. We then take these materials and we then reconfigure these materials so we can use them inside the body to induce regeneration. For example, here's a machine. This is a like, candy machine, but we call it electrospinning. Instead of using sugar through that needle, we're using fibers. And instead of having uh, cotton candy, where you have this mandrel that's taking these uh, scaffolds, that we can build in different sizes and shapes. And we can then use these different structures in the body for regeneration, depending on where you want to use it and what the size would be. Again, these materials are fully degradable. Once inside the body, they dissolve on their own. So we started doing this work in the early 1990s. And by 1996, we had done enough work that we could go to a patient with this technology. So here's a patient who was treated with this technology. You can clearly see the area of the injury. You can see here the normal organ, normal organ, and the injured area. I also want you to note that the bottom portion is normal, is the top portion only that's injured. So we wanted to use a material that we designed in the lab to help this patient regenerate their own tissue. So what we did is we basically took that material that we made in the laboratory and we used it to replace the entire top portion. We preserved the bottom portion that you see here, and we replaced the top portion that you see here with the new material. And by doing so, we were able to observe this rule that we had uh, shown that the maximum distance for regeneration of cells with that, or the regeneration of cells over materials was about half a centimeter from any edge. Basically, if we place a material in your body and there's a gap. The gap can be fixed by the patient's own cells walking on that bridge. So let me explain to you how that works. This is like a bridge. And the cells, there are no cells here. This is just the material. But there are cells in your tissue. And the cells in your tissue see that bridge. And the cells start walking on that bridge. And they bridge the gap. And once those cells are on that bridge, the cells themselves build their own bridge as this bridge resorbs and goes away over time. And that's exactly what we did with these series of patients. You can see here the x-ray prior to surgery, and here you see the x-ray six months after surgery. Now the question here, is this really regenerated tissue or is this really acting as a just, just a device? Actually, this is really regenerated tissue. What's happened here is the cells walked on that bridge they laid down on that bridge. They laid down their own bridge. The material we put in went away, and this was real human tissue that was fully regenerated using these materials alone. And we now have used these materials. These materials have been used extensively in many, many,
applications, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, anything where you need a small gap that needs to be bridged. And these materials are very useful for those purposes. So that is using materials alone. We can also use cells alone. For using cells for therapy, there are many strategies. For example, we can use this for patients with burns. And if, you, if the, a patient has a burn, it can vary how deep and how severe the burn is. And we can then try to replace that tissue. Usually first degree burns do just fine. You can treat them uh, on their own. They will heal on their own. But second degree burns and third degree burns can cause a lot of scar and disfigurement. So the, the strategy here is why not take a very small piece of skin from the patient, normal skin, and then you tease the cells apart from the skin. You then process the cells, place the cells in a spray area, and then spray the cells over the burn. And this is a technology developed by Dr. Fiona Wood. And we have basically doing, been doing clinical trials here at Wake Forest, directing uh, 10 centers throughout the U.S., in uh, clinical trials is going to lead to the uh, uh, FDA approval and clinical application of these technology to all patients uh, that come with burns. But basically, they just spray the burn, and this is a program that's currently funded by the Department of Defense for some of our wounded warriors as well, where they're benefiting from these technologies if they have a burn. We can also use cells and scaffolds together. And for this uh, uh, type of strategy, we use the strategy any time that you have a larger defect, anything that is larger than half a centimeter from any edge. We talked about the maximum distance for regeneration using material alone is half a centimeter. Anything larger than that, you need both the materials and the cells. What do I mean by that? The, the concept here, you have a patient who has an injury, in this particular case, this patient had a urethral injury. That's the channel that connects the bladder to the outside. These channels are fairly long, in a 24 centimeters long, so they're very long because they curve around the pelvis. But let's say that you have a patient who presents with an injury in that organ, and now you have a large defect, much larger than half a centimeter from any edge. The concept here is you bring the patient in, about four to six weeks prior to their scheduled surgery. You take a very small piece of tissue from the normal organ, uh, the tissue that's still normal, very small piece, less than half the size of a postage stamp. We then tease the cells apart. We then grow and expand those cells outside the body. Once we have enough cells, we then take that the same material, very similar materials, we tubularize them, and we now coat those materials with cells. So it's very much like uh, uh, making a layer cake, if you will. You're taking one cell type and you're layering one cell type on one side. You're layering the other cell type on the other side. Once you have your construct fully seated, you put it in this oven-like device called an incubator. You let it cook, if you will, there for a few days, and then you're ready to put it right back into the patient. That's exactly what we did surgically in a series of patients. Here's an X-ray. And here's a bladder, and here's a total, this patient was in a motor vehicle accident. And you can see here, entire defect from here to here. It's just contrast extravasating where it shouldn't be. There should be a long tube, and it's missing. So the, again, this is clearly large, uh, greater than half a centimeter from any edge. So we create the construct. We put it in the bioreactor. We seed it with cells. Here's a construct fully seated. And here's the x-ray of the patient before surgery and the x-ray of the patient after surgery, showing you that now this fully regenerated organ, we published that paper in 2011 in this journal called The Lancet. When we published the paper, we already had up to a six-year follow-up in our patients, showing the long-term uh, success of this patient series. Another, uh, uh, other types of tubular structures, same strategy. So again, same uh, strategy. This is a blood vessel that was engineered. This is a vessel that goes from the neck to the brain uh, right here that we replaced. But basically, these bioreactors, what you see in these bioreactors is that these bioreactors are, that we use are being used to exercise these blood vessels. So you can see here the blood vessel pulsating. 
And the reason we do that is we want to make sure that these blood vessels are exercised and they know what to do before they get implanted. And this is actually, this was highlighted in this uh, journal, Nature Medicine. And this is a uh, vessel that was implanted experimentally that goes from the neck to the brain called the carotid artery. And now there are many, many different uh, clinical trials by many different investigators all over the country using blood vessels, uh, engineered blood vessels for different indications. We also have made uh, more complex uh, tubular structures such as heart valves. This is a, an engineered uh, heart valve prototype that we have in a bioreactor to show you how we're using these bioreactors to exercise these blood vessels. You can see here their heart, heart valve leaflets opening and closing. Again, exercise structure so they know what to do once they get implanted. Now we have not implanted these in patients yet. This is still experimental and we have had uh, several renditions of this to go to the clinic uh, in the future. We've talked about flat structures such as skin and they're by far the least complex. Now they're all complex, but the least complex are flat structures. They're flat, so architecturally they're easier to make. They're made up mostly of one cell type. Tubular structures like blood vessels and urethras are a second level of complexity. They're tubes, not flat structures, so they're uh, slightly more complex to engineer. Two major cell types instead of one. The third level of complexity are hollow non-tubular organs like the stomach or the bladder. Here the shapes are definitely more complex. The cell types are functionally more complex and there's usually more interaction with other organs. So this is the third level of complexity and the bladder is one such organ. Same strategy here. We basically, uh, the concept was bring the patient in six to eight weeks prior to their scheduled surgery, take a very small piece of tissue, less than half the size of a postage stamp. We then take that piece of tissue to the laboratory. We then split the cell types. It's made up of two major cell types. Once we have the two major cell types, we expand these cells outside the body. Once we have enough cells for our construct, we then build the three-dimensional construct in the shape of the organ made using these resorbable materials. We then coat the outside with one cell type, the inside with the other cell type. Once we have it fully seated, again, very much like a layered structure, we put it in this oven-like device and we then are able to put, place that right back into the patient. And we publish our preclinical work in this journal. Our human experience, we started doing clinical trials of this uh, technology and we were able to publish uh, these trials uh, in 2006. When we published the trials, we already had over a, a, a five-year follow-up in these patients as well, showing that these could in fact function and these patients are still walking around with their functional engineer bladders uh, doing well long-term. Now, by far the most complex organs are the solid organs. And the reason for that is that there's so many more cells per centimeter than either a flat, tubular, or hollow non-tubular structure. Much more complex to have a solid organ because there are many more cells per centimeter. The blood vessel requirements are very, very, uh, uh, very high. And therefore, about 25 years ago, we were in tissues at that time. And we came up to a challenge. This was about, uh, uh, we, we, we had a challenge, and that is that we could grow the cells in flat structures and they would do fine. Uh, but about 20 years ago, we came to a uh, really basically an entire challenge. We couldn't go any further because we really did not know how to engineer these into three dimensional structures. And that is really when it occurred to us. We had this, you know, th this. Uh, uh, concept, why don't we take donor organs, solid organs, and wash the cells away from those, and let's say we have a liver, like a donor liver, and we, instead of discarding the liver, some of these livers are not used, so instead of throwing that organ away, why not reuse the organ, and the way to do that is you bring something like a liver, you use very mild detergents to wash the cells away, two weeks later you're left with something that you can, that looks like a liver, you can hold it like a liver, it feels like a liver, but it has no cells, but we are able to preserve the blood vessel tree. And that's exactly what you see here. This is actually a liver that has been decellarized. Very mild detergents were used. That's why you see it now totally 
clear. There are no cells. It's just the glue, the collagen that's keeping all your tissues, all your cells alive. But we are able to preserve that blood vessel tree. So now we can reuse this organ by using the patient's own cells. We can then perfuse that blood vessel tree with the patient's own blood vessel cells. We can then infiltrate the parenchyma or the structure of the liver cells, and we're able to form these miniature liver organoids that you see here that are able to, to have a lot of the functionality of a normal liver. They secrete proteins that liver secrete. They absorb things the liver absorbs, and they metabolize things that the liver metabolizes or processes. But now we can make them only about the size of a small lemon. The challenge is how do we get, get them from a size of a small lemon to an entire organ, and that's really a lot of the work that we're doing currently at the Institute. Also about 12 years ago, we started looking at alternate ways to engineer tissues, and uh, uh, it, it came to us this concept of actually, um, we had this concept of why not uh, scale up the technology. We were really creating these structures by hand, one by one. And really our concept is to scale it up so we can actually create many tissues at the same time. How can we scale up the technology? And so we started looking about printing. And this is about 12 years ago. It's an inkjet cartridge. And we just use your typical desktop inkjet printer that we modified. Instead of using ink, we use cells with a hydrogel. We modified the printer so it had a 3D elevator. So every time the printer would go through, the elevator would go further down. This is, we then can crank up the elevator after printing this two-chamber heart that you see there. And about, it takes about 40 minutes to print, and four to six hours later, it starts beating, as you see here. These are the, the heart cells uh, beating. And you could see the whole structure beating together. But interestingly, modified desktop inkjet printers that we were using did not allow us to have the, the, the firmness and the integrity of the structure necessary to implant these inside the body. So we then started working on developing our own printers. And so over the last uh, uh, 11 years or so, we've been working at the Institute to develop this technology and build our own printers that can actually print real tissues and organs that will be able to withstand pressures inside the body. And the way this works is by creating this uh, matrix model, uh, this scaffolding system with the cells and the polymers or the materials that we use so that it gives it that structural integrity necessary so we can actually implant these tissues. And these are our, actually our, the printers that we currently use uh, at the Institute. So the way this technology works is that we use, uh, basically we look at x-rays uh, and we look at the x-ray uh, defect and we can then download that data, that digital data, to actually create these structures using different scaffold systems, different materials, and different cell types to create things such as bone that you see here, or a digit in terms of bone content of a digit, a finger, or an ear or a nose structure. And these are structures that we are basically working to make sure that they can be, uh, that they can be uh, printed. And this is actually a piece of bone that was printed using these techniques. That's an x-ray of a piece of bone. We currently have uh, available software. Pretty much every major hospital has this available software uh, that where you can convert x-ray data into three-dimensional data nowadays. And this software is being used for surgical planning. But we sta actually started using this software also about uh, uh, 15 years ago to design our scaffold systems. But here you can see this is a commercial available program called Terra Recon. What you're seeing here is the actual three-dimensional rendition of a patient's x-ray. So a patient goes, has an x-ray, and then from that x-ray, the software can actually give you this three-dimensional rendition of what the organs really look like inside the body. So you're no longer looking at this black and white picture. You're looking at dimensional structure inside the body. And then we can take that data, for example, for the kidney, we can then take that software and use that digital data that we can then download into our CAT printing software that we, de that we design at the Institute to actually convert that digital data into this printing structures through these, uh, through these uh, bioprinters. And you can see here the printing of a kidney structure. We actually use a polymer scaffold on the outside 
that holds the gel together until the gel is able to harden with the cells and we can then use hot water to dissolve the outer shell that you see there. In addition to, give a, to, uh, to giving us scalability, the ability to create these organs many at one time instead of handmade one by one, uh, the, what the printer does, it also gives us precision. We can be a lot better in terms of the precise where these cells can be uh, placed. And so you can see here with the color-coded uh, cells here how precise these structures really are, uh, whether they be liver or heart, uh, or kidney, the, the structures here are very, very precise of where you place them. So the bioprinter gives you three things. It gives you scalability, it gives you precision, and it gives you reproducibility. And basically, what we are doing now is we're taking all these structures that we used to make by hand, and we're now making them with a printer. This is, for example, some of our earlier work uh, creating miniature kidneys uh, that were implanted uh, uh, experimentally. And again, we can make these now in a small size. The question is, can we make them larger? And that's all going on for the solid organs. Another advance in bioprinting, uh, over the last few years, we've been building printers that can actually scan at the same time at the bedside. So what we call on-site scanning and bioprinting. The concept here is instead of actually printing the structure, and then taking it out of the lab and putting it into the patient, why not print it right on the patient? And so, and this would be now for just surface area. So the concept here is patient has an injury, you uh, go with a scanner and scan the patient. Once the patient is scanned, that information is automatically transferred to the printer and the printer goes right ahead and prints right on the patient. And this is our, our current unit that we've uh, built ju to do just that. This is a pictorial of how the technology works. Here's a scanner. It scans the wound. Once this, that information is transferred, then here come the uh, inkjet, the uh, printing devices to, to actually print the cells where they're needed in the right location. This is just a prototype showing how that works. In addition to that, we uh, are now um, uh, using this technology to print uh, structures, uh, what we call body on a chip. So one of the major challenges for drug development is that uh, a lot of effort gets placed into developing drugs that can be used in patients. And a large amount of funds are, are used every year to screen millions of compounds, literally every year that get screened by the pharma industry, millions and millions of compounds that get screened to get compounds that could have utility in a patient to improve their blood pressure or to treat Parkinson's or heart disease or diabetes. The challenge is that when these drugs finally make it through that screening process and all that early testing process with cells and a small animal models, when they finally get to the patient after spending all those years and all that money developing that drug, when it finally gets to the patient in the phase one clinical trial, 90% of these drugs fail. 90% fail. And the reason is that the screening is being done on cell lines, cell lines, not real, normal human cells, but cells that are not, uh, that are uh, transformed. Or they're done in rodents, on rats or mice, which are not humans, obviously. So what happens is these drugs may have an effect and may be safe against these cell lines, which are not normal cells, or against uh, small models, animal models, but they're not going to be effective in patients, and they fail. So the question is, how can we make this better? And the way to do this is to, uh, this system that we call Body in a Chip. This is a program that we have funded from, uh, uh, from the Department of Defense. And basically, the program here is we borrow technology from the computer industry, from the microchip industry, and we borrow technology from the diagnostics industry, what we call the biosensing industry. So now what we have is basically bioprinting the technology creating these tissues. We have bio microchip and biosensing technologies and combining all these technologies together we can bioprint these small organoids and once we print them we can print them, we can print human hearts, human livers, human uh, blood vessels, miniature uh, organs that we can then place on these microchips and now they're going to react in many of the same ways as a human body reacts. And So for example we can now print miniature liver organoids that when we 
products such as uh, Tylenol, and if we increase the dose of the Tylenol, the liver organoid actually becomes toxic. Or if we give it a drug that the liver metabolizes, that the liver processes, it's going to process it in a normal manner. So we test in real time what happens with these drugs just on a, on a microchip uh, using human organoids that we bioprint. So it's another technology that we're using uh, with a bioprinter. So what I try to do for you today is really give you an overview of where this field is. We've talked about basically using materials alone, and we can do this again for areas where there's a small gap, less than half a centimeter, where your own body will regenerate a crop, and that's being used clinically. We have also talked about using materials and cells together, and that's for the larger gaps, anything larger than half a centimeter from any edge. And this has also been used clinically. We've talked about using bioprinting as a technology. We, we can actually bioprint these technologies. And we've also talked about uh, using the decellarized organs. We saw, we've also talked about the complexity of the organs. We've talked about level one uh, being the least complex, such as skin. Level two being the tubular structures, which are, have a second level of complexity. Level three being the hollow non-tubular structures, we have a, which have a third level of complexity. And finally, these mo the most complex organs being the solid organs, which are level four. Up to this point, we've been able to implant the first three types in patients. We have not yet implanted a solid organ into a patient, but we are using cell therapy where we can inject cells into solid organs to help them regain their function. And implanting the actual solid organ is still years away. I'd like to incidentally mention that this figure was created right here at Forsyth Tech by these two wonderful individuals here. So every time that we go around, this, is, this image is credited to, uh, to Forsyth Tech. So basically then at the Institute, we are uh, working on over 30 different types of tissues and organs. We've implanted about 20 of these in pa 20 percent of these in patients. We're working on bringing the rest of these technologies to patients in the future. And I'd like just to leave you with a very small video clip of a patient who was treated with these technologies uh, ago. This is a clip uh, of a recording he had uh, uh, three years ago. I'm sorry we don't have a, uh, I don't know where the speaker is on this thing. I hope you heard that, but uh, <laughs> but anyhow, so that's Lucas Masella. There we found it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's Lucas Masella, um, and he's now 13 years out from having received his engineered organ. Many challenges ahead. We really do. We have continued challenges with scale up, continued challenges with r the right patient selection, continued challenges with the cost of the technology. We still have many challenges ahead. But one thing is certain, and that is that these technologies do have the potential to make patients' lives better. 
And for us, that's the promise of regenerative medicine, to make patients' lives better. Mentioned today and for hosting me. So I'm wondering if this, th it does work, great. And Dr. Tell, you're available for a few minutes for questions? Yes. Okay, great, okay. Just one second, please. Question. For these organs, when you grow them, uh, how does the vascularization take place? Do you, do you do something or it's an automatic process? It's a great question. For the flat tubular and hollow non-tubular structures, the vascularity just occurs on its own because you're, the, the body basically just rewires that tissue. For the solid organs, you really do need to preset the vascularity, and that's why it's uh, more of a challenge for the solid organs. Questions? Hi, uh, uh, this is Shaun Rahman from University of Hawaii. Uh, I was wondering, does your technology or this technology works for spinal cord injury? So for spinal cords, the spinal cord, the challenge with spinal cords is very, very complex because, you know, the, the analogy I make is, have you ever seen those cables for the Internet? You know, there's these huge cables that have, you know, thousands of wires going through them. That's what your spinal cords like. So it's not just replacing uh, uh, one thousands of nerves at the same time and asking to reconnect. So there's work being done on nerve. Actually, we do have technology uh, that has been developed in terms that's nerve gaps to uh, fix nerve gaps. But it's to actually replace entire spinal cord is still not within our reach, and probably it's going to be a long time for that to happen. I'm Josh Grab. I'm in the math department. Um, my question is, uh, for uh, particularly for the skin replacement, how how soon after the injury occurs does does skin replacement have to happen? If if there's already scar tissue, do you have to remove that and start anew? Yeah, so you can actually, you know, with all these traumatic injuries, you know, including burn, the first thing that the patient needs is resuscitation and and uh, stabilization uh, of the wound, and then making sure that there's no infection. So usually that takes several weeks. You know, you'd never, you, you, uh, the current standard is when a patient comes in from a burn, if they require a graft, graft that patient for, you're not gonna really put the permanent graft for at least six to eight weeks. And that really is a nice window of time because it gives us the opportunity to grow the cells and have them ready for the patient if we need to expand them ahead of time. Nikoi Evans, student here. Um, has this been tested successfully in children? Yes, actually we have had technologies uh, uh, in children. In fact, uh, several of our tissues were, were used in children first. Um, and, uh, and some of them were used in adults uh, first. But we have had uh, organs that were implanted in children. Um, other organs, that, you know, including some that I didn't mention today. Uh, and what we found is that as the children grow, the organ grows with the patient. Uh, so that the body recognizes the organ as its own and then it just grows just like it would if it were a normal organ. Hi, Dr. Tyler. I'm Dean for Math and Science here at Forsyth Tech. Thank you for coming and speaking today. We have a lot of students here, and I just wondered if you could comment to these students about uh, the potential for jobs in the bioscience industry, and in particular, regenerative medicine. Yes, I think, you know, the future is really bright when it comes to biotechnology and biosciences. You know, the, uh, the um, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, did a study uh, looking at this field, and they basically identified this field as being the next frontier of medicine for the 21st century. Well, you know, so you are seeing that right now. Uh, you're seeing that inflection point where the field is really growing and really taking off. Um, so one of the nice things about the field of regenerative medicine is that you, it's really truly a multidisciplinary approach. You know, one of the challenges I always have when giving a talk of this type is that people may walk away thinking, boy, this is so easy. You know, you just plop some cells in a scaffold and there's an organ. You know, there, there's the organ. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, you need cell biologists, material scientists, biochemists, uh, molecular biologists, geneticists, uh, physiologists, 
you need technicians that can uh, do the work. You need uh, people who can be engineers, people who can work on uh, printers, people who can work on software. So really, it's truly a multidisciplinary approach that uses all of the all of the STEM sciences, uh, all of the STEM uh, areas. Uh, and so it's a very promising field, and I think that uh, the job opportunities will definitely be there as the field keeps advancing. And one of our major things right now is, you know, getting the right individuals with the right talent. And again, that is why we're so fortunate to have your school here in our region. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Sorry, Julie. Uh, uh, Lucien Huenu, I'm an uh, instructor in biotechnology department here. Uh, two part questions. Um, most of the organs that you re engineer, do they have to be innervated, nerve uh, supply? How do you ensure that the nerve supply is uh, appropriately um, inst in, uh, installed, if you will, in the organs that you re engineering? Second part, what are you doing with um, cells, in, in you know, either adult stem cells to create um, adult tissues? Yeah, so great question. So the first question is the innervation is same as the vascularization. It just said when, once you put these structures in the body, the body will rewire them. What you're really doing is you're really recapitulating embryogenesis, you know, and your natural wound healing response. For example, you've probably experienced this. If, you know, if you've had surgery, uh, and uh, during surgery they cut through the nerves, uh, the small nerves, which happens all the time, you, you know, because you're going through the body, uh, you don't have any sensation in that area after healing. And then it starts itching, you know, and then you start having the sensation again, those are growing. So at the same time that your blood vessels regrow, uh, your nerves regrow at the time of injury, uh, when after surgery, after controlled surgery, it's the same thing that happens with these structures. You're basically putting these uh, cells on these scaffolds that have the right uh, organizational structure and the body basically identifies this as your own tissue and it'll rewire it with both the nerves and the vascularity. But again, that's not the case for just like solid organs, need, uh, you need to uh, put the right vascularity for a solid organ. It's the same thing for solid structures like the spinal cord or the brain. So we're talking about flat tubular, halonontubular structures where that's the case. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very nice presentation. Touch Academy, nanotechnology instructor at Foresight. So what do you think about the role of nanotechnology in Bridgent? Yeah, it's actually one of a major area for us. Uh, you know, we use nanotechnology for a lot of what we do. So we're using a lot of nanofibers, nanomaterials, and so we have a nanotechnology core as one of our cores. So we have basically 12 research cores, and one of them is a nanotechnology core, so very important to what we do. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, here we go. That's good. Thank you, Dr. Atala. Um, I was wondering, is this, is your program integrated into training for doctors or, or pre-med training? Yes, we're very much into education as well. So it's one of our core aspects of our mission, which is research uh, uh, discovery uh, as one part of our mission. The other one's education, and the other one is clinical translation. As part of our educational program, we have a very active program. We uh, have a uh, programs at all levels for uh, uh, college students. We have a summer scholar program for college students. Then we have a postgraduate program for people who finish college and are trying to get a PhD. And then we have a postdoctoral fellows program as well. And of course, we also have MDs that uh, work uh, pass through our shop for their training as well. Giovanna Taylor from our St. College in Florida as oh. part of our grantees. And uh, I think we're going to cut the questions off because, uh, and sorrowfully, but um, Dr. Attell has to return to work, and he's on a tight schedule, and and uh, so uh, <laughs> that's right. And and um, I was really pleased, Dr. Attell, as Michael Ayers said, uh, and Courtney Harrington's slide up there is a part of our grant. That's right. So that's where oh, the funding came great. from. I just want to say that really Lucius did the heavy lifting. Right. 
<laughs> That's Dr. Harrington right there. Thank so it's you. my pleasure to introduce Alan Murdoch, who's the Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development, who's going to thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I don't know what to say. Uh, thank you is just isn't enough to just see what well, remarkable things are happening in Winston-Salem. But on behalf of Forsyth Tech, the North Carolina Bio Network, the consortium, and our students in this community, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, for the grantees, stick around because we've got more work to do. Um, and for, for the rest of you that came out today, thanks so much. Really appreciate it.